I think a lot of the challenge is just kind of getting through all of that noise, rewriting your own narrative about like what it means to be an academic spin out or a, or a female founder or a first time founder. You kind of have to reframe your own thinking around these types of things. We're at the most fundable companies event hosted by Pepperdine University's Gradzadio Business School, where a distinguished panel of investors, venture advisors and faculty evaluate startups on their financial strength, market opportunity, leadership and more. This event recognizes the nation's most fundable companies and celebrates the founders that are shaping our future. It's building the dream. So I'm Nicole Polk. I'm the founder and CEO of Siren Biotechnology. And before this, I was a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at UCSF. Siren was really spun out of work in my lab where we were really motivated to try to use viruses actually in a medical setting. So coming from academia, Talk a little bit about that journey. How is that? If you would have told me when I started my, my academic lab that like I was going to leave and go start a startup, I would have said, like, you're crazy. There's no way. We started this project back in 2017. Fast forward, ended up becoming the company, but that was never the vision. We weren't planning on that. The fact that I had been a professor at Right, UCSF, like a pretty snooty school, right? <laughs> a pretty big deal. Meant that I was often approached by companies to be on their scientific advisory boards. And then COVID hit, couldn't come back to work, right? That was back when you were still stuck at home right. and Lysoling off your groceries and these types of things. But all of my colleagues out in industry were considered essential workers. They could go back, but we weren't allowed to, even though we were literally like a virology lab. Like, oh, we have to start a company. We could go back to work. And so there was this, this kind of motivation of like, we have this data that was like the best thing I had seen in 20 years being in the space with like this experience I had already had. And so it kind of all bore out of that, that initial motivation of like wanting to just get back to work. When did you get the like this light bulb moment. So I knew the, the data had legs, but I wasn't necessarily thinking like, oh, I'm definitely gonna start a company. Like that's just, it's so foreign for an academic. I was actually presenting um, in uh, in Grand Rounds and we were presenting some of our some of our data and they were like, where is this data? Like this is, this is remarkable. Have you thought about running a clinical trial? Like, and so our clinical colleagues were the ones who were like really kind of, kind of impressing upon us like just the magnitude of the data that we had and really wanting us to make sure that we had enough money like to go run a, a more more meaningful clinical trial. It took a while to gear up to that uh, and to finally say yes, but once I made the decision, then I was all in and, and then the rest is history. I mean, that was courageous yeah. to like, I'm gonna leave all this and go in the industry. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. I was like, well, I won't leave unless I can raise the money. So if I raise the money, then then I'll leave. How did you make that transition, right? From academia to running a company, it's different planet, right? It is simultaneously exactly the same and completely different. different. So the number one job is the same, go find money. The next most important job is like, go convince the absolute best people in the world to come and work with you. Go out and just evangelize your story and tell everyone in the world about your science and try to convince them that it's the most important science that has ever happened. Or, you know, yada, 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 like all those things. Just get the roadblocks out of your people's way so they can do the best possible science. We talk about these worlds like they're super different and there's no overlap. They totally overlap. And it's a common misconception that we have, which is that, oh, academics would make terrible founders. Talk a little bit about your, your journey. And I think a lot of the challenge spinning something out of academia is just kind of getting through all of that noise. And so a lot of it was just getting rid of all your preconceived notions and your biases and like more like kind of like shaking the etch-a-sketch and being like, no, actually, like, I don't, I don't know why I had all these thoughts. So much of this does feed directly into being, I think, a really good entrepreneur. So a lot of it was really just kind of rewriting your own narrative about like what it means to be an academic spin out or a, or a female founder or a first time founder or a, a young CEO or any of these things where there's this notion that all of those things are bad. Like, and yet like we're absolutely killing it. So it's just, you kind of have to reframe your own, your own thinking around these types of things. And like getting over that was probably one of the biggest challenges. What's a piece of advice you could give entrepreneurs out there? You, you went through some serious, like you laid out the challenges, yeah. right? And you're successful, so. And we were so unbelievably lucky that Founders Fund led our seed round. And the reason we're lucky is not just because they have infinite money, they're like a money printing machine, and they have unbelievable street cred and all these types of things. The other reason we're so lucky that Founders Fund led our seed is because they despise boards. So you're preparing these decks, 
you're sending out the pre-reads, you're like having like, you know, practice rounds with the various, uh, you know, team members in, on your team that are gonna be presenting to the board and all these types of things. And I mean, it is a solid week of preparation every quarter. And so we didn't have a board for the first three years and it was actually fantastic. If you're lucky enough to raise money from a firm that's really founder friendly, ask them, would you be willing to not set up a board at like pre-seed or seed, the beginnings of a company, it's just, gosh, you're just changing every, every week is different. Don't pre-formalize everything with governance that you don't, like you're not a big company yet, you're two people or something. Right. You know, like, do you really need this to be so formal? See if they bite, because man, if they say yes, you've just saved yourself so much time and you can get more formal and get governance and all the things when you're a bigger kid company and you're ready for it. But if you can manage to swing not having a board when you're a really teeny tiny company, huge time savings. You know, how has your vision changed from when you started? Any advice you have for entrepreneurs? I would say don't be afraid of it. Figure out ways to leverage it, right? This is a super dynamic moment. It's like get comfortable with change and figure out how you can leverage the really dynamic moment that we're in right now. And like, don't be afraid of the fact that there's a lot of regulatory change happening at the FDA. Leverage it, figure out what are ways that you can use like these rapidly changing, you know, guidances and these types of things. They're very willing to listen to CEOs right now. They're actually out having things like CEO listening sessions with companies. They want to hear what could we do differently that would help you bring medicines to patients faster. Like you don't have to be a Pfizer or a GSK or a Merck or a Novartis or something. They will meet with you even if you are a small CEO because um, they love small businesses and they want folks to be bringing innovative medicines to patients. So like, don't be afraid to like literally call your senator, literally, and be like, hey, can you get me a meeting with the FDA commissioner? You'd be surprised. Sometimes the answer is yes. One of the remits I've had at every round when we talk to investors, and one of the questions I always ask to them is I flip that and I ask them, what is your vision? What I want to hear from them like as like table stakes to participate in one of our rounds is that I get to remain CEO. So a very common thing that you see, even here in 2025, like my goodness, what year is it? We're still talking about this, is whether or not you should have technical scientific founders be CEOs rather than CSOs. And I want to be the CEO. I want to make sure that our vision can change and be dynamic with the time, but also that we don't allow like a program to get squashed. We're doing something so new. We have a whole new like fourth drug class that we're innovating and developing. And when you're doing something that new, people, right, it's like, it's risky and it's scary and it's nervous. And people are like, well, maybe, maybe you should be the CSO. So one of the questions I ask to investors is, like, what's your vision for what I'm gonna be in this next fundraising round? And I want to make sure that I hear from them. Uh, and so wanting to hear that they have uh, a big vision and that they wanna see me as uh, the, the steerer of the ship. Yeah, I don't worry about like, are we IPOing? Are we m and Are we gonna stay private and issue mm, dividends? Like, okay. if we make like the world's best cancer drug, everything will get sorted out in the details. Right. The, the, the current best-selling cancer drug of all time, it's been the reigning champion for the last 23 years, is Keytruda, right? It sells $24 billion a year. If you can get to a world where you are making $24 billion from just one asset in one indication, it doesn't matter if you're public or private or if you've been acquired, right. like, right. that'll all sort itself out. Would you think advice for another entrepreneur in a similar situation is stick to your guns and try to take it all the way through the end? Right, because like, this is where the, the risk comes from drinking your own Kool-Aid, if it's like, if you do the like, no matter what, just fight the fight and like keep going. It's like, no, sometimes you do have a bad idea. Sometimes you do have a bad product. Sometimes, you, so it's knowing when to listen to your gut and to tell the VCs and the outsiders and the journalists and whoever like, no, you're wrong, I'm right. But then no, also knowing when to kind of check in with yourself and be like, was I right? Having enough kind of self-awareness to kind of check in with yourself and having people around you that are not yes men and yes women mm -hmm. who you can be like, I think one of the hardest parts of entrep right. entrepreneurship is figuring out when to just keep trudging forward when everyone doesn't believe versus like real like having the self-realization to be like, man, we we should pivot. This isn't working. Right. And so like that's a, a delicate dance, and I don't know that there is any advice on when to listen to yourself and when to tell everyone else to be quiet. Um, you have to kind of figure that out. Yeah. That's the journey, you have but to figure that out. Always be aware that you yeah, could be, be aware. aware. We'll always never have as, enough information like the scientist in you is like, oh, I want to run five experiments and know definitively the answer. You will never know the answer. You just have to decide, like, are we doing this? Are we taking this deal? Are we not? Are we using this investor or not? Are we going to run the clinical trial this way or not? You'll never have the answer. Right. So you have to just decide and just own it. and Conviction. And just have conviction and just run the run.